Well, I want to thank the Lord for His help tonight and for leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit for uh, the touch of the witness only will turn your sorrow into joy. At the, at the same time that all of us, when God leads for something and a promise is made, can reach up and claim that which is needed. Just to sing next, by God's grace. I want to thank Him for all, everything that's taken place, that God would help me to speak a little about international events. At the same time, I want to say that I have absolutely, I don't even have an upset feeling. I am not disturbed with our president. I, am, I love him and have, I'm very prayerful about these meetings. I'm not disturbed with the Chinese leader. In fact, I like his looks. Can you put that together? You see, so oftentimes we can't deal with heated issues without wanting to kill somebody or be very upset. I'm sorry that he sold out to a philosophy that's involved the loss of 35 to 65 million souls. Communism. Nevertheless, God could save him and forgive him as easily as he forgave me. And that's the wonder of the God we serve. So I, I'm not, I don't feel bad uh, at him. I, I do see the incongruity, the upheaval against a man who committed a wrong. Uh, but in the eyes of wrongs, he was not nearly so wrong. Uh, the difference would be like me knocking a window pane out of this window and then somebody come in and shooting everybody in this place and then not, don't sit down beside me because I knocked the window pane out which is wrong mm -hmm. and sit down beside the man who slaughtered everybody in this house that's the difference that's the difference in, in Watergate and 35 to 65 million souls that's how silly we are but I thank the Lord <coughs> that you prayed that way and God could give me the strength, the people, the place, and the time to speak a little bit about our values in this society. And also then again to say that uh, I am very concerned for the president. I am very concerned for these meetings and uh, very concerned. I'm very, I feel very warm toward all parties involved. We just need help and revelation from God in this world. I am concerned about you or I wouldn't speak in, in the way that I have. These, this is a few thoughts on election. And uh, I want you to read with me Romans 9 and have the, the thought of election in mind. Then we'll try to go back and point out a few things. Paul said in Romans 9, the notice in your new international version, and I... I do recommend this. All the preachers have copies. And as far as I'm concerned, it can be our second Bible. We think it's that good, by God's grace. They're rather expensive, but Zonervan does have a $7.95 copy out now, I think. This is a $14 copy. You have an $18 or $16 or $17 copy, but there is, a, there is an $8 copy in a smaller uh, Bible, and it's very nice. I speak the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, <coughs> but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, 
But Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Now here's where I start underlining. Yet, before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? <clears throat> For who resists his will? Carnal mind reacts quick. How does Paul answer this? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if... He did this to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy, whom He prepared in advance for glory. Even us, whom He also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As He says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. And I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. Israel cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out His sentence on earth with, the speed, with speed and finality. It is just as Israel said previously, Unless the Lord Almighty has left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel who pursued a law of righteousness has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Stephen asked the question in Sunday school class, how did you get to church number six? Well, you might be able to find out where the leadings were. And how it came into play, there might be, you might be able to trace some pattern. But if you're really honest, reasoning and logic will finally give out. Because there's a mystery in godliness. There's a mystery to this thing. And that mystery can best be summed up in the word election. The calling, the mercy, and the grace of Almighty God. Would that we knew more about Almighty God. Our sovereign God. Because the men that we met from Nigeria knew more about Him than we do. That is, they saw more of His nature than we do. Because in America, 
Our philosophy, in order to break, I know determinism's back, but in order to break a previous religious determinism, we were taught in our country that we determine our own destiny. Uh, destiny. That we have a rendezvous with destiny. Well, we have a rendezvous with destiny, all right. But I can't agree that we have only to fear fear. That's too much in our own hands. The uh, American mind has felt that if a man would work hard enough, he could achieve his dreams. But the philosopher of today has found that it just won't work. The technological society has brought us more heartaches in the eyes of some than it's brought us good. We don't seem to be as happy as grandma and grandpa were. We don't seem to be as near, nearly delighted with the, with the earth. No wonder there is people who want to go back because they see something over the past that looks romantic. And so man is still in search of his dream. And the more in search of it he is, and the harder he works for it, the more it, loses, it, it eludes him. At the same time, there's a happy group of people who have contentment when they have very little of nothing sometimes. And when they get a little of something, it doesn't make, it, make them any happier as when they had nothing. And they're on the way, indeed... <laughs> to a rendezvous with destiny and they tell us that God is fulfilling and going to fulfill all of their dreams. We got to church number six because there is an almighty God. When I go back to my boyhood days, that's Scott Depot Christ Fellowship, by the way, when I go back to my boyhood days and think that one little human being on the face of this earth, a boy who was not, who was liked, who had a, a, a small town family, who had a mother and father who had respected, but when you put it all together, you didn't have enough to, to hook me up with Scott Depot, West Virginia. But who in the course of his life was so stirred with the gospel, so thrilled with the humility of his father, so touched by the lives of his parents, that a dream for him, a wish, a desire, that he could live for God, and that when he grew up, that he could walk with God and he could hear from God like the men of the Old and New Testament. And if he couldn't hear from God like the old the men, and, uh, men of the Old and New Testament, he'd sure like to meet someone who really did. Because if the Bible was true 2,000 year, years ago, if these things were true and God was the God that he was here and he still is that kind of God, the Bible said he changes not, then that ought to be able to come to pass today. And so... 19 to 54, he saw a story on film entitled Peter Marshall. And he was so stirred up that he felt better than whenever he'd watch Superman or Batman. And that would stir me when I was a boy. Or if he'd read Tarzan or Bomb of the Jungle Boy and stir our hearts, the, the Hardy Boys and Auntie Drew stories. Oh, it's just wonderful for good to triumph over evil. It's wonderful to get the stories to turn out all right. It's just wonderful, even back in the fairy tales, to hear it read, and they lived happily ever after. You thought that was right. You thought that's the way it ought to be. And you read the story of Peter Marshall, and even though he, his life was taken, yet his influence lives on today. His wife writes, his books sell. And out of his writings, I read a story. Mr. Jones, Meet the Master, I think, a series of sermons. And out of, those seri out of that series, there's one in there entitled Research Unlimited. And out of that story, out of Peter Marshall's life, I received such a challenge because Peter Marshall said, 
in all this technological age, in all of this science and all of this industry where men will take one proposition and work with it to prove it to, tr- uh, prove it to be true, why doesn't someone take this text? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And let all these things be added then unto you. Why doesn't anybody just take that and build their life on it? Peter Marshall said, I've never seen anybody do it. That made good sense to me. Or he chose another, and he chose another, the promises of God. Why is there anybody who will go into spiritual research? I challenge me. Now, <laughs> I got to Anderson College, and I got in a group called Revel Prep. Religious something of preparation. And for two years, I tried to teach a course on prayer. And I got a book from Redlands University, California, where they had, they had experiments in psychology and prayer. And I worked for two years to teach this course on prayer. As far as I'm concerned, it was a total flop. Oh, we had a good time. It, uh, it was interesting. I labored hard. I brought in men that were searching for God. But I was, I was pushing so, so hard to bring that dream to pass. That was preluded, of course, with an experience on the banks of the Mississippi when I would cry and pray, Oh God, and these desires would come out. Where is, a, where is there a man that walks with thee like the men of the Old and New Testament? Oh God, what, what about my future life? What am I going to do? I remember so very well lying on my bed one afternoon looking straight up, I don't know how to explain this, but looking over as if it were a Chinese checkerboard and seeing a number of holes up there and there was a little marble rolling around. I watched that marble roll and uh, each of those holes represented a calling because I was in upheaval over my calling. Even though I've been preaching since I was 15 years old, I was in upheaval over it. And as I watched those holes, I said, now Jesus, I'm going to let that that marble drop into... Uh, accountant right there. That's what I was at the time. I was an accountant for Cook Cotton Company. Let that one drop in right there. And then I said, I, let dr- I would uh, get all those holes and it wouldn't fit. It'd roll in some time and roll back out. Finally, I came back to where it said pastor. and it Or preaching or pastor. It rolled right in and stuck. <laughs> I looked at that. It was upside down. It was over my eyes like this. I don't know that I've ever spoken of it publicly. But when it went in there, it didn't come out. And I looked at that. I said, all right, Jesus. That was it. All right, Jesus. Okay. I thought so anyway. We'll just try to preach. (laughs) Now, I tried to change that to an industrial chaplain. And I pioneered the concept in Anderson, Indiana, lectured, wrote articles on it, and, and had an had a interesting time going. But that all came to a halt. Thought maybe a military chaplaincy would be a good place. They told me it was good pay, prestigious position. Man could have a pretty wonderful time and still fulfill his calling. <laughs> so I checked into it. But before all that could come to pass, I got a call from my father. He told me there was a man we'd been looking for all of our life. His name was Robert Morgan. When I got to Robert Morgan, I asked him if there was such a man that lived with God, that walked with God like the men of the Old and New Testament. He said, yes, I know of such a man. The first time my question was ever answered in the affirmative. I've been asking a question from 60 to 66. That led us to Lauren Helm in April of 1966. And then we heard a different message. Instead of trying to do something, we were taught to wait. Instead of trying to work it out, we were taught to relax and let God work it out. Oh, it's, it's, really, it's really something when I get to thinking about it. Things began to change in our life. A dream had come true. We began to listen. We began to see that God was leading and God was working. 
It was a wonderful challenge to me. Oh, what romance in those days. And for the first ten years, before we entered a new phase of our walk with God, it was almost as if it were romance day and night. Because each day held a new challenge. It still is. Each day held a new challenge. Each week was a new challenge. Each month was a new challenge. Each six months was a new challenge. It involved a little country church in Ohio. Can you imagine when God finally did make it clear where we were going? It said a little church in the cornfield. 1,600 population. A little church that hadn't grown in a long time. Took us out into obscurity. Took us down and just hit us away. A man who was supposed to have talents. A man who was supposed to have ability. A man who was a, <clears throat> an innovator. A man who wanted to be a creator. Tried to be a creator. Put him in a little old traditional parish row. And his classmates thought he surely must be off of his rocker. Left his job. Left his, uh, uh, his, uh, the money that was being given to us at the time to pay our way. And went in the middle of a cornfield. At a little old church where they rejected him. Where he started losing sleep. Where he went to the woods to pray. <clears throat> where nevertheless he felt like he was walking on holy ground. Disappointment. Where he saw that his abilities, all if he had any, and all of his education, all of his training was not going to do him any good. All this came to pass. Yet, in the middle of such agony, in the middle of such, of, uh, such uh, disappointment, there was such fulfillment. Because we didn't have anybody but Jesus. Even Brother Helm wasn't very close. Brother Morgan did come through to see me now and then, but it would seem like we were just left there to die. And that's what we did. We died so much that we didn't want to preach anymore. And when we ended our experience there, we ended in an ecclesiastical trial. I don't remember what the charges were. One of them was improperly forming the pulpit committee. I, I, I didn't even form one. The other was we were praying over members to put on the pulpit committee. I went to Anderson to ask him how to do it. But that was the rumor. And I've thought about this. There's so much controversy around about us right now. But did you know that the sign of a true ministry is controversy? This sign of God's moving and the sovereignty of God in the election is, is in the controversy. We do everything we can to keep from being controversial. And in there, it, of course, it put me in a whirl. I didn't know what in the world was going on. I didn't know much about election. And I didn't know much uh, uh, about uh, God's calling. But uh, I did know I was called. I did know that Jesus was working. I did know that my dream was, was coming true. And somehow, I felt like the power of the universe was behind my life. Though I was totally rejected. Though even on the day that I left that place, Bill McPhail had to drive in, having driven in all the way from the West Coast, came all the way down to stand beside me to keep one Bible scholar from choking me to death, literally. Because the man was so stirred with me that we were afraid he was going to hurt me. As long as my wife was beside me, that she puts fear in people. In some way, she does that. She has a manner about her that makes men back off. Oh yeah, I, I mean, carnal men. They back away from her, brother. They did that before she ever got the gift to get up and prophesy. There's something about her. Something about her eyes. Something about her determination that caused men to back up. So she would stand beside me. But that day, I had Bill beside me. I preached that day on uh, child, child likeness. And I preached in such joy and I preached in such love and I preached in such weeping. I had a man get in the car and got to witness on the way to the, on the, way to the thing and I was so thrilled and happy about it. That he picked me up walking into church. I guess it was or I picked him up. I guess he was walking that day. And I was so excited about it. But as I began to preach and God began to work, there was such a stir in the place and every, every heart that had been set against me was so stirred that day they were glad to be rid of me. And yet it was the biggest crowd. The day that I left was the biggest crowd that had been in that church. In the whole two and a half years we were, we were in the ministry.
And then we prayed about church number six. Brother Ham was in the public phone booth, Miami, Florida. <laughs> Some of you are so blessed. <laughs> See, it's a miracle to me that God would work this way. It touches my heart. Here we're talking about election. We're talking about these things working or why we're here. I've just got a few illustrations, another scripture or two. But it's going to do something for somebody. And we'd be so desperate, we want to get out of the preaching business. But the Lord would say, no, you've got to continue preaching. And the church that you're supposed to go to is that last one on the list. Son, that's the place. Church number six. And God in His providence, God in His sovereignty, God in His calling would bring us to a place that chewed up preachers and spit them out in little pieces. So was the report. But in, in His calling and in the door that was open to us, they didn't chew me up at all. Oh, what chewing was done only helped me. That's another mystery of election. How that He can turn all evil into good before it reaches you. And how that in all things we find that He is working for the good. For those that love Him. Now here is a mystery here. How in the world this sovereign God can call somebody and choose somebody and then turn everything in His life into a blessing, even the negative. So, so that He's purified in the process. So that he longs for more of God. So that he, it brings him to nothingness. So that it grinds him to powder. So that the testings and the trials and the temptations drive him closer to the heart of God instead of farther away. And in the process, people leave a few at a time. It's always been a, it's always been a, a thing to me to hear somebody talk about a church split when we never had one. People tended here all these years and said, when did we split? And you look at the records, you start with 69, and you go from 69 to uh, 79. We're here, aren't we? 69 to 79, and you find that we had a build up all the way to one year there when we dropped 20 or something and then jumped back up and started again. There was no split there. Nobody hardly left. There was more people called out from us in that year. John McAdams, Strong's, uh, Kermit Hodges. And so right in there, people were called out. I thought, oh God, you brought them in. Now you're going to take them away. But look, look at the offerings. Look what happened there. From 27000 to this year, over $300,000. No sign of a church split. Statistically, it's not there. Even if it did appear in the paper when eight people left us last year to join others who had left us over the years, forgetting that for everybody that left us, three came in their place. Forgetting that that's the dynamics of anything that's vital in life. And when a church starts to grow and people lose their places of office and young saints come along and they elect those in whom that they see have the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, that it's a normal, healthy, growing process that should take place. And that if a man's worth anything at all and he's really called of God, there ought to be some stir in that place or they ought to take his credentials away from him. They do exactly the opposite. If he can keep, if he can keep, the, if he can keep the same old sing-song situation going and not grow any in 10 years, he can keep his credentials. But if he starts, if he gets a hold of God, and he's trusting God. Or let's say he's just waiting on God. That's what I did. And he, he comes in, he loves the people, he likes everything they love. He didn't might try to make any changes the first year, only to drop the bulletin. And most everybody was pleased with that. Because it would be hard to work with a bulletin here tonight. It, as sovereign as God is, he has a rugged time with a bulletin. I'm not against bulletins. Because God can, he can line up the program, put it right down on paper. He can do that, Stephen. He's done it. So he's not against bulletins. He uses one once in a while himself. <laughs> but in this calling and in this wonderful work, I see 
the hand of, of, of election, the mystery of godliness, the chosen of God. And whenever I think of your lives, well, that's, here's one I had on my list tonight. What explanation do you have for it, dear ones, when you think of the life of Jerry Bays, who knows more than 95 to 98 of all the preachers of the world? That's where the witness is. And yet, he's never had any preacher training in his life. He doesn't even come from a godly background. I can tell you one thing. When mama gets out there and sees her boy up here, it stirs her up for Jesus. I explain all that. Election. Election. The calling of Almighty God. I explain Monty Chittam. Election. The calling of God. How do you explain that God put an angel, a special angel by his side when he was 15 or 16 years old and he knew it at the time? And he was unsaved and he was ungodly acting. But in his heart, there was an honesty. Waiting on God. Waiting on the time, on the fullness of time. And in the fullness of time, the sovereign God in his almighty power reached out to a loving wife and one praised the Lord from a preacher boy Amen. which lodged in his heart. Looked like if he was able to resist the United States Army, he could resist that. He couldn't. How do you explain it? Election. Election that's powered by a sovereign God. That reach in and touch this boy who's a fine gentleman who had gentle and beautiful qualities, who was quite a man. Not a man of the world, but who was called to be a man of God. How do you explain a man that's so intelligent that through all of his reason, he reasoned himself out of a God? Never quite gave up hope, but reasoned himself out of a God. He becomes a part of the burned down America group who has a mysterious philosophy that out of those ashes, if we can get her burned down, out of those ashes may arise something good. But what we've got so bad, we just going to have to burn it down. Was the thought a few years ago. Still here, but not as prevalent. We don't see as much of it. How do you explain that when we go over there and try to talk to him, that we knew on an intellectual level we would never be able to reach him? That it took a, a precious man who's been saved out of the boxing world to go down... And witness to him who didn't, who didn't have that formal type of thinking. And can say to him, I want to tell you about what God has done for my life. And hush every argument he ever had. And put a hook in his soul. Do something so wonderful for him that he would respond in the affirmative about helping on a building campaign. And yet, he really thought that all these churches should be burned down. How in the world do you get a man who, who thinks that all churches should burn down and try to help build one? See, I've just hit on a vital, vital, vital point. By God's grace, I've just demonstrated election. Election. Because this boy is too bright to be fooled. He's more than a boy. He's a preacher man now. But, but he's, he's too bright to be fooled. When I'd start to talk with him, my education wasn't too bad at the time. My thinking processes weren't entirely deteriorated. But I, I knew if I headed down that area, I wasn't going to make it. Because he'd meet me head on. And he'd meet me with such love. He'd meet me with such honesty. And you know, but you know what, what got him? He would, he, what got him was my genuineness and my sincerity. He thought I was sincerely wrong. He thought I was genuine. But it got him anyway. And he was like Huxley. He hoped there was something back of it. He, he just hoped I was right. Huxley said to one, would to God, I, I could believe. Do you really believe in this God? Do you really believe in this Jesus Christ? And why don't you act like it? He said to one thing, I would to God that I could believe like that. This boy didn't have the reasoning. I mean, he had the reasoning. But to his logic, it reasoned him out of a God. He thought he was a machine. Programmed. Determine what kind of God would it be that would help me to know 
to send down to him Dr. Francis Schaefer escaped from reason. Yes. <laughs> oh, bless God for every boy. <laughs> Some of which troubles you. <laughs> but would break this boy, it would be the logic that this fellow needed to break his determinism. God, the trilogy. Escape from reason, God who was there. And uh, another one. He is there, he is not silent. And reach into his heart and, and uh, help him to know that he's not a machine. But it still didn't prove God. So in coming to help Bill, that uh, a church that he thought flat philosophically that he should burn down, he comes and he finds evidence. Joy, peace, and love. And so, I don't know how much he thought about it, but he found himself right down here at an altar of prayer when it was back there, saying, Pastor, I can't talk about the devil. I can't talk about Jesus. But I know that there's got to be a God behind this joy and this peace and this love. This love and I'm coming on the basis of the evidence. A, a brilliant man. <laughs> Came into my office a little later. He said, I, you know, I, I've gone with several girls, but none of them have really touched my heart. If God were to reveal someone to you, w would you be sure and tell me? Rodney, I sure will. If God reveals anybody. It's, it's a too long of a story to tell here tonight. But how He could reach up and save a little Catholic girl? who'd never heard of Rodney Taylor? Up in northern Indiana in a hotel room, I think, in a rented place, not in a church. Saved her, I think, that night. We called her in that room under the man who walks with God, who, whom God said that I was supposed to come to church number six and that the Lord would bless our ministry here and that we'd, we'd meet all of you. And God be working your lives out at different places to bring you down? Who had, who had gotten a hold of Jim Stocks just a few months before and got him out of an awful alcoholic condition? A man who was in deep, deep darkness who went as many as six days without even knowing that daylight was daylight and dark was dark? And have him waiting on persons like the Cullums? That when they came, and though he had had a, even though he had had a spiritual awakening through AA, he, that uh, when they came, he knew that he needed to know our living Lord. A bright man also. Or just a little touch on this life. A little touch. In that, in that same coming, the Cullens touched Jeannie's life also. Right out here in the parking lot. She's telling me about how she drove in the fog. She, didn't want to, she was frightened of fogs because she'd had a wreck. And it hurt her. And how that she had to lean out her window to get to church that day. And when she got here, she got in the car with the Cullums and she thought she's lost forever. She thought she'd just done so many things and so many things that happened in which she couldn't be hardly be saved. And the very prayer that she needed that day, Brother Cullum prayed. He rebuked the devil. Drove back the accusing enemy. The very thing she needed. I've just given you another example of election. He didn't know anything about it, but when she was there just a few days ago, she mentioned that, and what do you think he did? He just broke down and cried, like he always does when God blesses him. And so he brought her down, and they were joined in marriage here. And God, in His loving sovereignty, and power because election is powered by a sovereign God through our faith. And, and it's a power that's undeterred. It's a power that always accomplishes its objectives. <laughs> He's a God that really has got a whole world in His hands. Yes, there is a God. Anything less than that any person less than that 
couldn't be called a God anyway. If I may say real carefully, oh no, so you may not know anything about the, about the origins of Mormonism, but the Mormons believe that God was once a man like us. And that he... He was on another planet. He was so obedient that he became God. Yeah. And Stephen said, in our office, he said, I'm not interested in that God. I want to know who was the God he was obeying at the time. Who is the man without origin? Who is the person without origin? That's the God we're looking for. And that's the only God that can be sovereign. See? I was hanging on for dear life when I, when I read that whenever uh, this precious man had the vision, he saw God in materiality and Jesus Christ. He thought he saw Jesus Christ. He said, hear my son. The problem with that is no man seen God. And the problem is the materiality of God because God is spirit and cannot be seen like that and it touches my heart. To have the witness of the Holy Ghost. This sovereign God I'm talking about, you cannot materialize Him. Now, that's hard sometimes on our minds, but He's a God, a God of Spirit. Right. They that worship Him, worship Him in Spirit and truth. Jesus has a body, but God does not. That's a little hard on us, I guess. But that's the way it is, folks. Yes, that's what He's revealed Himself to be in the Word. Right. I'm glad He gave Jesus a body. Yes. See, we wouldn't know what to do with he Jesus down here. Yeah. But then, the, the Word that was given Him, see, if God's a help of me, or He wouldn't be witnessing like this. But she's needed this. She's needed us to talk to people. God gave her something real wisdom. In that. Boy, she just had an argument. Yeah, it was it. She settled it right now. See? Because one religion is not as good as another. And I'm very careful, very respectful of Mormon people. But if it's a cult, you need to know that it is. And, and all cults are trying to destroy the Trinity, whether they know it or not. And what, and what God said to... Uh, or Jesus said to Joseph Smith was that the creeds are abomination unto God. Boy, I drew back immediately and pled the blood when I read it. Because my friends, the creeds, and, 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 and Church of God background people, why did we ever join such a spirit? No creed but Christ. Well, Christ is our living creed, but talk like that, folks, can send folks to Mormonism. She needed the Athanasian Creed. One of the three great creeds, the Apostles' Creed. See, we just get all, see, we didn't know how cultish we were. That's a, that's a little sign of a cult right there. To obliterate all creeds. We may not know it, we may not have a cultish spirit, but see, the great creeds, the sovereign God, somehow in working through Athanasius and working through these early men, got the Apostles' Creed and the Athanasian Creed and the Nicene Creed, and these great creeds have given us orthodoxy, have, have kept what the revelation of God was, at least kept it in word. What we need is the living Christ within. But this does explain the orthodoxy of it, you see. So whenever that person, whoever that was, said that these creeds were abomination unto God, I pled the blood and drew back when I read it. Because I knew that wasn't right. There's something wrong, Rodney. Now, if it wasn't, you and I today would have to fight the orthodox battle all over again. We'd have to fight the orthodox battle. But the sovereign God, the God of elections, already fought the battle. You're, you and I don't have to fight it. Hallelujah. He's, already fought. He's already fought that battle. People aren't fighting what's orthodox Christianity. I tell you, it was fought in blood at times. Men tried to trick Athanasius. They tried to lie on him. They tried to kill him. But I tell you, and they put him in exile, but God stood behind him and he finally got it written down and got a few bishops enough to approve it. So you and I have got it today. We don't fight the battle anymore because we know that these great creeds tell us about the revelation of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Co-equal. Person, three persons, but one God. There's your fundamental difference between uh, what is Orthodox Christianity and cult right there and everything rises and falls upon that revelation. Think of that. Oh, we've, Jesus helped us right here. Wonderful thing how the sovereign God is working. How in the world did they know to put these books in this Bible? God didn't let a note fall out of a, a UFO. Dear Lord. Didn't work that way. Tells he said it didn't work that way. But I'll tell you, the, the, the people of God, in the church of the living God, there was enough of them 
that the Holy Spirit spoke within them when these books were read. And by the witness of the Holy Spirit came about the canon. That which was not false, the Spirit, that which was false, the Spirit wouldn't witness to. But let me tell you something this. Oh, praise God. How in the world, how in the world with folks like they are, did they ever get them in there? How in the world did Orthodox Christianity for the most part keep out the Apocrypha, which has in it salvation by works? How did they keep it out of there? By the witness of the Holy Ghost. Most of them didn't know what it was. But they were honest and they walked with God. And when they brought the votes together back in the, back in the old days, they knew that this was what sounded, this was what witnessed to their hearts. These stories of Jesus, not the ones where He sat all night in a place and He got at the apocryphal Gospels. He got up and, uh, and He said, um, uh, He got aggravated some ants over there, so He just cursed them and they died. That's, that's not my Jesus. That, that didn't make it. Why didn't it make it? The Holy Ghost wouldn't witness to it. It's the wrong use of His power. Oh, just think of it. Think of, it. Think of election. Think of His sovereignty. That's why the old, the old, the old word's trustworthy because the witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, God's arrangement and His sovereign power has put this thing together, brother, and bequeathed it to us. Oh, it's tremendous. Tremendous. We can walk in assurance and in love today and in thanksgiving to know that a God's great enough to put that together and get all of it to harmonize from Genesis to Revelation can do everything for you and me 